not to say before, but some regular images along with these. And I think all but one, I have matched them up. There's okay, let's take a look. <laughs> there's one. So I wanted to show this one because this when I look at this one, the one we're seeing now, the, the, the flower, um, you, you know, you got the beautiful blue in the middle. You got the green on the edges. You got the pink in the middle. You got some yellow there. It's just, it's just you know, wonderful colors all over the place. And you have the speckles that are happening everywhere, which you didn't add. That's just, that's just what... The, the speckles are the pollen from the flower. So the okay. pollen is fluorescing. And you get to see those little speckles as the pollen has fallen off of the stamens uh, or as a pollinator has rummaged around in the flower because this was uh, outside in my garden. And uh, I chose it specifically because it was almost fully bloomed, but not quite. So yeah. I brought it into my studio in complete darkness and, um, and and set it up this way. So, so this is not that that, that pollen's not actually on the petals. That's actually airborne at that point. No, it's on the petals. It's, okay. it's, it's fallen. You can kind of see there's more in the bottom. Right, more the on the top. bottom. That's, right. uh, that, right. that's gravity for you. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So if you want to see the Tim, if you want to see the before. Uh, yes. Or not the, I keep saying before, but it's not before. It's the, you know, yeah, the, sure the, 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 the other, uh, the alternative light. Yeah. Okay. That okay. is, that's the way you'd see it with your own eyes. And sure, it's nice, but I'm not going to win any awards with that image. Um, it is completely transformed in ultraviolet light. Mike, do you have the uh, the actual uh, the further back uh, photo of this one? I'm not sure if I, I think I sent one? it to you, but yeah, oh, that's look the at one. That. Yeah. <laughs> so you can see this is really illustrative. I wouldn't, of how I wouldn't the image have expected taken. anything different from you, Don. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, the, the image is not cropped at all. You can see it on the back of the camera. But I've got these modified flashes, and of course, yeah, one cost me a certain amount. But once you make one, why not have more? Uh, so that you can shoot at lower ISOs or freeze the action a little bit better. Uh, there's a, a tent, uh, if you can call it that, on a table in my studio uh, made with two folding chairs and a giant piece of felt fabric that I would be draping over this entire setup with the lights off when the image was actually being taken. Mm -hmm. Because uh, as we talked about visible light contamination from the light source, it could also happen from the ambient light as well. You want to be doing this in darkness. Mm -hmm. So um, that, uh, that setup with uh, that camera, and that's not a fancy camera, that's just a, a Lumix GX9. Uh, it's no flagship product or anything, but it's a, a nice uh, uh, premium compact uh, travel camera that I have with a uh, Leica 45 millimeter macro lens. No extension tubes or anything, nothing fancy. It's the, the only thing that's fancy here is the lights that are being used in the scene. Okay. <laughs> so now how long is an exposure on that? Uh, well, that's not a long exposure because you're using flash, I would think. Right. Well, here, here's another technique that I like to do. Um, it, if I can get it in complete darkness, you'll notice that the, the flashes, um, they're, they're all off camera, but I have no wireless trigger on, on the camera itself. So in this scenario, what I do is I set up a longer exposure. Something could be even 30 seconds long, but at uh, like F16 or F22 and at a, um, a low ISO of... 200 or something. Now, the flashes in one burst aren't going to give me enough light, but if I have my wireless flash trigger that has a little test button on it that'll fire mm -hmm, the flash right, right. whenever I press it, I will have everything in complete darkness over 30 or 60 seconds, and whenever the flashes beep to say that they've completely recycled, I pop them again. <laughs> so I'm popping the flashes multiple times uh, over a uh, you know X amount of time. I can't remember what the final yeah. exposure was on that one, just to get the highest quality result. In this case, because the flower is not moving. If it's uh, you know with an ant or something else, yeah, I only have the one shot. Uh, I, I can't uh, I can't do multiple bursts there. So but, how many flashes do you think you're taking of it then? Uh, yeah, depends on how fast they recycle. Depends if I've plugged in external battery packs into them or not. So you, you, you might be taking quite a few, and that's 30, 60 seconds. Oh, between 10 and 20. Okay. Yeah, that's all. Okay. And guess what? Uh, YouTube has decided to go live now. So welcome to um, uh, In yes, Progress. We are. Welcome to J.P. Raw, show number 233 <laughs> with Don Kamarachka. I sort of said his name right. Um, already in progress. As YouTube has had trouble tonight, we're continuing on. But you came at the right time. We're just really getting into infrared, not infrared, ultraviolet photography. We're showing a behind-the-scenes shot uh, where Don has got three flashes set up. And, and these aren't crazy expensive flashes. You Like this setup here with those three flashes, what, not excluding the camera, 
How much would you say that set up there cost? If I could build each of those flashes for $500, that's $1,500 to have three of them. So that's not super cheap, but honestly, you'd only need one of them. Um, uh, you know, and you can move it around and be popping it multiple times in different angles. Yeah. Um, and so if you want to buy a flagship flash from Canon or Nikon or any of the, the big manufacturers, uh, you'd be looking at $500 plus depending on what you're doing. And um, in this case, these flashes will allow you to explore an entire different area of photography, ultraviolet fluorescence. And if you're just tuning in now, because we're now live, uh, <laughs> please re-listen to this because there's a lot of juicy information we've already gone through. Yeah. All right, <laughs> yeah. so I got a question. I, uh, I have uh, two, two uh, really good flash units. Actually, I have a, I have a third, but it's not the top end. Uh, so now, how do, what are you doing to modify that? So, uh, and this is important that I'm using cheaper flashes. These are young Nuo 660s and 685s um, because their Xenon flash tube in the flash itself does not have any coating on the flash tube itself to block ultraviolet light. It's depending on uh, the diffusers and focusers um, in front of that pieces of plastic to block or absorb the ultraviolet light. So it's two screws and a couple of little clamps that you have to remove. It's a five minute modification and I've actually recorded a YouTube video showing me doing this, um, which uh, hopefully we can get the links in the show notes. Yes, that, that, that would be interesting. Um, yeah. And uh, so it's a, it's a really simple modification. Uh, Modders be warned, flashes have high voltage capacitors. Yeah. I don't want anybody to kill themselves. So uh, if you're not used to dealing with high voltage electronics and you've put batteries into a flash, that capacitor probably still has a charge. Yeah, so, it's like the old two, uh, uh, TVs where you couldn't take them apart because they always had a charge in them. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, when I'm doing this stuff, yes, I'm not really working near where the uh, the capacitor is, but still, I only uh, do this with a fresh flash that I bought just for this purpose and uh, haven't put any batteries in. Even then, technically, you could still have a charge. So, you know, right. modders be warned, high voltage ahead. But uh, it's it's really not that scary un unless you die. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's not scary at all. Yeah, it's, uh, you don't know anything. <laughs> yeah. So, and I'm re-showing the, so, you know, had the behind the scenes shot, I'm re-showing the result. This is what the image looks like you know, to our eye, um, or the, the flower looks like to our eye. This is what it looks like uh, with ultraviolet light in that setup you had, uh, which is just amazing. It's just so beautiful. Um, it's transformative. It becomes an entirely different thing. It does. I mean, who would have known? When you're looking at this thing, you don't see the pollen little specks everywhere because they're the same nope. color as the flower. Um, you don't see that that center blue, you know, you know, the very center is black. The outside uh, center ring is is not that. Um, well, that you would know blue. that there's two separate colors. That's yeah, even, it's just that's even better. It's, uh, the petals, instead of just being one solid yellow, are, are two distinct colors, yeah. which is interesting. Well, and, and here's the other interesting part. If I took a photo of this flower in ultraviolet reflectance, again, that's different. That's directly capturing the UV light. That's what insects see. That's not what this is. But where those petals are pinkish in the middle would be jet black, and the outer edges of them would be bright white. And that would be like a bullseye for an insect to dive right into right. the middle of the flower. Right. So as a byproduct of whatever mechanism the flower is doing to do that, it fluoresces differently in those different regions. Oh, that's interesting. That's cool. And so now uh, we go back to the ant one, um, I believe. So Don gave me behind the scenes shots. Uh, I tried to match them up to what I thought they went to, and I think there's there's one I don't know. So <laughs> you're gonna have to help me with that because I'm really interested to see what the end result was from this behind the scenes one. But this one I think I got. So you got the ant here, which if you look at it, it looks fairly normal except for the eyes of the ant. Um, and is this the the behind the scenes shot? Sort of. Sort of. Uh, there was another dandelion shot that uh, this is the behind the scenes of as well. But this illustrates a very important point that these flashes are almost on top of the subject. They are just about touching the flower. Uh, and we could regale people on the inverse square law all we want, but um, if you move them like a fraction of an inch closer at that distance, it will have a marked increase in the brightness of the uh, of the effect. So uh, sometimes I'll even have these flashes in the frame. So long as they're not interacting or touching the subject, I can edit them out. But you want those flashes to be as close as possible to the subject. Yep. Wow. Okay. Let's look at another behind... Um 
our visible eye, which is, I believe, this one. Yeah, which... this is a, uh, a yellow lady slipper. They just finished blooming in our garden right now. This, of course, was taken a few years ago. Yeah. Um, but it, it's a beautiful flower. Uh, maybe it could have been on a different colored background to be even nicer, but it doesn't really stand out. But looking at it, pay attention to the fact that the, the main stem and leaves are green. And the variegated color on the other little twirly leaves is kind of a yellowish, uh, yellowish red color. And then the main flower itself is yellow. And then if we can see this in ultraviolet fluorescence, um, you'll see it transform again. So Look at the that. Uh, same one, yeah, the exact same flower. <laughs> Uh, oh my God! Yeah, because watch, now, I'll the, go back the, the and forth. The spider wasn't invisible. Boom. Okay, so the the, the, sp <laughs> the, the spider was uh, uh, was from uh, my my main ultraviolet attempt, and then when I took the behind the scenes photograph, I already had let right. the spider go. I put him back outside. Okay. Um, but the, all of the things that were green or close to green, they're fluorescing a deep red color. And uh, you get blues and yellows within that. The spider itself would have normally been mostly black, uh, but its eyes are glowing just like that ant was. And there's yeah. something about insect eyes that make them glow blue in ultraviolet light that I haven't figured out yet. But it does make it mesmerizing. Maybe it's, it's, oh, that, it goes that's with, just what, amazing. Yeah, with what they can see, with the light that they see that's also causing the way they look. I don't know. All right, so yeah. now I have, a, I have one more question then, because you're, you're talking you can't have any light bleed. So when you take these pictures, to, is every, all the lights in your studio off then for these pictures? So how do you see what you're doing or using remotes? But now you said you're hitting the test firing button on the flash. So in, how, how's that In this working? case, this is at a higher ISO um, with the, uh, the, the camera uh, at, triggering the flash for the exposure. So this is one, uh, one shot of the flashes. Right, might that's just, right, because you have, you have the spidey cam can't count on him staying still. Well, exactly. And so this might be at ISO 3200 versus ISO 100 or 200. Uh, and, and that's fine. I, so long as I can get the shot, uh, I'm, I'm happy with it. Uh, but um, in this case, in order to see what's going on, uh, I will do a test shot. I will take an image with the, uh, the wireless flash transmitter off. Uh, and just see what the image looks like. If it's completely jet black, I know I don't have any visible light that's going to contaminate the scene. So I can have a dim amount of light in the image uh, or in the scene uh, around me so that I can see where the spider is and I know when to press the button uh, rather than having absolutely nothing at play. So um, we'll go to the next one. Yeah. So I messed uh, that up. Some some flowers, uh, some families and classes of flowers will work better than others. I found that anything in the buttercup family uh, will work really nicely. Uh, but uh, in this case, this is a succulent. And, and succulents and cacti, uh, they more often than not will give you a, a really fun fluorescence response. So the image we're looking at right now is visible light. This was uh, a, a shot that I had taken after the, uh, the ultraviolet image. And the UV one for this one, it... Again, it's got that science fiction feel to it, if we can flip to that, because yep. it just... <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that crazy? You wouldn't even know it's the same image if I wouldn't do it like this, where you can actually... No. Yeah. That, yeah. That's amazing. So, uh, you know, this is... I love macro photography. I love flower and insect photography, but um, I also love when I can make it feel even further from the world that, uh, mm -hmm. that that we all live in. And this is a great way to do that, especially because I'm not faking anything here. I mean, no. yeah, of course, like with any image, you're going to set the white balance where you want it to be, and you're going to, uh, you know, clean up little specks and and, and splotches here and there. Sure. You know, if there's sure. a blemish on a flower, yeah, I, I'm. Guilty. I'll clean a clean a spot off the flower. But what you're seeing in terms of color and glowing and everything else, that's all real. Wow. All yeah. right. Let's go to the one I have no idea what the the other <laughs> side is. Um, so <laughs> this is the behind the scenes or the uh, before. Okay. So I, if I describe this one to you, Mike, you'll probably get some idea of what this is. Okay. This is a small little stone. Um, it is a mineral called cerocyte. Uh, it's a lead ore derivative, but it happens to glow under ultraviolet light. A lot of minerals do, um, and some will glow blues and greens. Actually, some vibrant green ones I have. I haven't figured out what to do with yet compositionally. But hmm. this one glows yellow at about the color to the sun. And so what I figured out for an image is I thought, 
I would try to create a scene that depicts a narrative as if the sun has gone out. And flowers, as you know, will move around to uh, uh, to face the sun. Plants yeah. will do that too, and um, and so I've got a bunch of little third hand tools. You can see some alligator clips and some little tweezer appendages. They're holding flowers in line, pointing towards this thing as if they're growing in towards this stone that is the last light source in the universe type of thing. I got to tell you, this doesn't look like a stone to me. It looks like a, a flat, a little. Moss or something. I don't know. Uh, no, no the, you're seeing moss. Okay. But right in the very, very center, uh, or actually not in the center, it's a little bit further back. Okay. There is a tiny pale dot. Okay, it's I see off it. Yeah. Color from the moss. That is the stone, and you have tiny little Irish moss flowers going in around that. So if, you know the image that we had in the initial rotation. Yeah. So so again, Don gave me before and afters, and he said if you need help match them up, just let me know. And I think, and I can do it. Um, so, th and I think I got most of them right, but this one, I'm going to guess, and this is a process of elimination too. Is it uh, this image? That's exactly the one. Okay. Yeah. Look so at you that. have this stone that is glowing amid the moss with these flowers that are reaching in towards it as if, you know, like people sitting around a campfire. Right, 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 a campfire. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's glowing. It's their light source. It's their, uh, uh, it's their energy. Okay. And... So, so that that was uh, that was a fun combination of both uh, inorganic and organic natural ingredients um, to to create a, a this a completely false narrative. I mean, I'm just making this up. No, but it's super uh, cool. Artist. I mean, you got the stone embedded in that those whatever you call those moss things, um, uh, moss petals or whatever, and then you got the the things around it. And if you go back and look, I mean, this is that image there does nothing for you. No. <laughs> now, how many flesh are around that? Uh, three, I think, in that one. Okay. Three flash. Three. And um, the luminescence is happening because of the ultraviolet, uh, right? Exactly. So yeah. there's no visible light in this image aside from uh, the ultraviolet light that hits that stone and then fluoresces back into the visible spectrum that the camera can see. Uh, and there's a little bit of fluorescence happening in the flowers. You can see their pollen is a little bit brighter. Mm -hmm. The moss underneath isn't really fluorescing at all. It's just glowing because of the light of the stone. And most of the flowers are the same way. Um, so this was an attempt to use the visible light induced from ultraviolet to actually not just send that back to the camera, but to bounce off of the neighboring subjects and illuminate the scene. Yeah, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Yeah, th this was almost going to be, uh, this was a cover option for my new book. I, I opted with something else. This one meant a lot to me, but I would have to describe it to everybody yeah, yeah. before it made sense. So we went with something right, else. Right. Yeah, no, I get that. But it is a gorgeous photo. I can see where you would be tempted to put it on the cover. But um, the, the one you have on the cover is all the little water droplets, right? Yeah, so it's a, 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 an image I call Essence of Reverie, which has a, a wildflower seed emerging from the surface of a pool of water with water droplets all covering it, and each one of them has an image of a flower inside of it. So, yeah, which is um, an incredible image. Yeah, and the book will show you how to make all of that stuff, too. Okay. Yeah, that's well, good. We'll, you, we'll you'll look notice you're up to 1119 because I bought one. <laughs> oh, why, thank you. I appreciate I that. I see Tim. that live, yeah. When we started the show, it was 1118, and now Tim's 1119. So, yes. Tim, I can be first. I you, can't be number one. No, you I can't, can't be, be last because I'm sure, you know, with 32 days left, there's plenty more that are going to come in. Yes. But, uh, you, know, I, you know, you can't be first. That was already taken. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mike. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, and, and so, I don't know, did I get a behind the scenes on this one? I don't think we did, but yeah, this that, one... Right, uh, I don't have behind the scenes on another one, but you can uh, see... I didn't see the spider a, at first, but far left is where the spider yeah, is. Yeah, and so he's kind of doing a little maestro thing. I call this yeah. one the, the spider in the orchestra uh, or something to that effect because these look like uh, organ pipes. Uh, they are the flowers of something in the bee balm family, and uh, those flowers tend to have a really uh, vibrant and uh, multicolored fluorescence as well. Uh, so, you know... Uh, kind of a win there and I didn't expect that spider to glow bright greeny turquoise because the jumping spider earlier didn't glow at all except for its eyes but this one yeah he's a different story uh it don't even look like a spider I don't know what it looks like but it I did not get spider <laughs> at all well you know I am I am not a big fan of spiders and I've mentioned no. that on the show before uh, not, not many of us and are <laughs> generally I can spot them pretty quickly because I know I want to be away 
Um, but when I first looked at this, I was like, where is he talking about? Where's a spider? I don't yeah, it see it. It looks like some sort of underwater plant. <laughs> it does look like it could be yeah. underwater. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that uh, you don't completely dislike this image, Mike. <laughs> well, you know, it'd be better without <laughs> well, the spider. Does, but now he does. <laughs> <laughs> it'd be better without the spider. But no, it's a, it, you know, all these, every one of these we've seen uh, with the ultraviolet is like just incredible. It makes you want to, you know, makes me want to go out and, hey, let me go do this. Um, you know, of course, your water droplets and your, and your, the one thing it doesn't make me want to do, I will tell you this, of all your work done, is the snowflakes. <laughs> because you do such an incredible job with that, and I know how much hard work it is. It's not, you make it look easy to us viewers, uh, the end result, but especially when you do one a day during the winter, it's in, insane. Uh, but I know from talking to you that it is an incredible amount of work on both the photography side and the post-processing that I really have no desire to do that. I'm just going to sit back and enjoy your work. Yes. But, but some, I, I will say one of my favorite snow, well, it's not even a snowflake. It's the, I guess it's an ice crystal inside like a soap bubble. Yes, oh, the, soap yeah, bubble. the soap bubble itself is freezing I solid. I absolutely yeah. love that. That's just amazing. And you wouldn't know that's what it is. When I think you told us once, it's like, I, I love those photos beyond belief. Imagine a perfect sphere that starts to freeze solid with fractal snowflakes all over it. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Uh, uh, it's it's magical. It's man-made. But uh, yeah, even the subjects that we're dealing with today here, uh, they're they're they're, they're man-made. Uh, the snowflakes are not. But freezing soap bubbles, like you have in the image rotation there, um, that is something that uh, I love to spend time on uh, in the winter because uh, it's two feet from my back door. I don't have to go far, <laughs> exactly. and and if I get cold, I can jump right back inside <laughs> and you know put my hands under hot water or sip a glass of wine or whatever I need to do uh, to warm myself up. Well, I love showing your photos to my friends, or my six-year-old daughter, and, and you know everybody always says no snowflake is alike, and I can really prove it and I show it, and when they see it up close, they don't want to believe that it's really a snowflake, and then slowly they believe it, and I'm like, it's amazing what you get out of a snowflake, and really nothing is the same. I I really love that work. Yeah, yeah, and and really, no snowflake uh, is alike because even when you photograph the same snowflake one second after the next, they're it's either that they're, they're uh, yeah they're they're still uh, accruing new molecules of water or they're shedding them, they're sublimating, mm -hmm. uh, and so th it really is a transient subject, something that only exists for a very brief moment and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I know you've talked told us this more than once, but I wanted to talk about it again. So. The, the the flash. If I get a flash, and I get one of these uh, the Yagano or Yugano, however you however you say them, and I know I know lots of photographers who had them, who have them. Um, so any particular one or any one of those? I, I believe the six sixties have the longest uh, or or the highest guide number. Okay, and I chose that just on a, a guide number is not the total flash output in watt seconds and they don't publish that number um that would be the one you'd go for but the higher the guide number the further the light will go and so i'm just using that as a proxy for it to say that that's probably going to be the brightest one and you want maximum output from these uh, from these flashes um the filters that i put on the front there's a combination of two of them either of them now work well but not perfectly uh, one is a, a hoya U340 filter, and uh, you'll find them on eBay. You won't find them on uh, B&H or other uh, larger U.S. manufacturers because I don't think they ever marketed them in the U.S. It's kind of a niche product. But the Hoya U340 filter is one that will block visible light but let ultraviolet light pass through. Problem is it doesn't do it perfectly. I can't remember which end it bleeds a little bit on, but it bleeds a little bit of either the purple or the red side of the spectrum. And so you would have a color cast or contamination from that. So I added a second filter to the front. This is the most expensive piece of the equation. It's from a company called Midopt, Midwest Optical. They've shortened their name to Midopt, M-I-D-O-P-T. It is their BP, as in, uh, you know, a Bob Patrick uh, band pass is what it stands for, uh, BP365. And this is almost exactly the same as the Hoya filter, except it bleeds a little bit on the other end from it. So the two of them in combination clear each other's bleeds and let a very, very cure, uh, a pure ultraviolet signal pass through. That filter, you will have to talk to a distributor from the company. If you go to their website and you click on distributors, you'll find one close to you. And that's 
a, probably a few hundred dollars for that filter. That is by far the most expensive piece of the puzzle. Put those on the front of it, and away you go. Okay, and oh, I, there's my video. There you go. There's your video. So uh, as you were talking, I found your video. Um, how old is this one? Uh, uh, this I just had a month or two ago. Yeah, yeah. So it's pretty new. So, uh, and I'll have the link in the show notes so you can go over to Don's um, YouTube page and and see where you're talking about the conversion of this filter. So, I, I, you know, you can only get so many details from us talking about it. Uh, go over, you'll be able to go over his video and get more details on how to convert it. It's a it's a five minute video, so, so it's easy for you to take a look at. Yeah, and when, you, it all out. when you talked about fifteen hundred dollars for that setup, it was because you had three of these. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. I actually have five of them now. Because right. <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> yeah, um, but you know, for one, so I guess I can divide it by three, and for one setup, I'm going to be in the five hundred dollar range. But to really do this, I need to be able to in, envelop that subject into this light. Well, I, like I said, the Adaptalux with the UV lighting arms will cost you a couple of hundred dollars for five of those, yeah. uh, all strapped in together and having continuous light uh, for 30 or 60 seconds would be perfect. Uh, but if you have a subject that will move over time, uh, you'll want to have the flashes because that's the only way that you're going to be able to stop that action. Yeah. And we're not going to show this whole video, so... No, uh, no, it's five <laughs> minutes of boring that you can't even hear. You're just going to watch me take apart a flash and put it back together. <laughs> yeah, and and I typically don't have the the audio coming through because I don't know if the other side has got uh, music on it or not, and I don't want to get banned during a live show, which has actually happened before. So I, I never show... If I do it right, I never have the audio of a video we're playing come through. Right. So, and so, yeah, the, anyway. the, the hardest part about modifying those flashes, if you just saw me on the video, is getting the little pla rubber circle things off the side of the flash because uh, they're glued in place. You kind of got to wedge something in there. But once you got those out, there's two little clamps on either side. Pop those out. The flash comes apart. You put it back together. Bob's your uncle. Uh, and now you just tape the uh, filters on the front. Awesome. Uh, well, I, I don't know... I, it's on my list of things I want to do, Don. I don't know when I'm going to get around to it to, to, to do that. But I actually need new flashes. I dropped and broke one of mine, and I need to get a new flash. So who knows? Well, the, the young Nua flashes themselves, uh, I've used the ring flashes for macro photography. Uh, what is it? The YN14EX mm -hmm. um, is the ring flash. And it's, a, it's an identical clone to Canon's ring flash. In fact, it's better in some ways, and it's one-fifth the price. Um, so not just for this ultraviolet stuff. I've, You know what? If the flash dies, I've had to replace a flash bulb on my Canon 580EX2, and uh, that cost me $250 on a flash that I paid $500 for, yeah. uh, where the Young Nuo equivalent would have been far less than the cost to repair the Canon one and would have worked just the same, if not better. Mm -hmm. So, Very good. Well, um, we're heading into the, the final part of the show uh, here, and I want to go back over again. If you want to support Don on his macro book he's going to be coming up with, uh, you can head over to his website, which is doncom. Don kom.com or .ca, either one, and he'll have a link there, and we'll have it in the show notes too, so we can go over to Kickstarter, and you can um, become a backer for his his book that he's going to be putting out, and there's lots It'll of be options. Out for Christmas. Yeah, for Christmas time is when you're thinking it'll be out? Uh, yeah, Christmas 2019. Um, this is the only project that I'm going to be working on, aside from workshops and conferences this year. This okay. is it. Uh, so head over to his website. You'll see the link there, um, and you can go over and be a, a, a backer. There's uh, lots of different categories, so you can get multiple books. You can get one book. You can get, uh, I think I did the book and ebook. But there's lots of options for you on what you want to pick. Do that. And you mentioned workshops. Uh, tons of workshops you got going on. You have that there on, on your website. Uh, and uh, if you really want a great workshop, which I wish I could do, and I was prepared to do is the one in Iceland. You got four spots open for that. It's in October, so you got some time. Uh, but you, you know, only four spots left. So you want to get jump on that if you could. Just head over to his website, and you got the little workshops there. And of course, Don, you put out a weekly podcast um, talking about various stuff. Don is like knowledgeable on everything that there is to <laughs> know about photography. Uh, every time I'm on, I've been on your show four times, and every time it's like. Hey, you got to pick something I'm going to know and I'm going to understand. And there's always at least one subject where I don't know how much I can add to that, Don. <laughs> it's going to be all you. <laughs> 
Well, you know, we, we try to distill it down to to things that will mean something to the average photographer. Uh, you know, how it will impact your uh, y- your life within the next week. You know, something that uh, you know, a little trick for you to do, some technology for you to keep your eye on, uh, what might influence your next uh, gear purchasing decision, etc. Um, or just heck, where things like computational photography is going to make us all out of a job as photographers within the next 10 years, and we can sulk about it. So uh, all of that and more. Yeah. So check out uh, Photo Geeks Weekly. You um, put it out weekly. And, you know, follow Don on Twitter at doncom. I guess, hash, what is it? At Doncom, that's what it is. Uh, on, on Twitter is just at uh, Doncom, D-O-N-K-O-M. Uh, you'll find me on Instagram at Doncom Photo because apparently somebody else had Doncom before I got there. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's that's the I guess the nature of the internet at and large. Yes. Of course, you know you do one of the things I, I often tell photographers: make your website your center hub. So you know he you know you own and host your your website here and. You know, you can go over there and all the things I you talk about. I have to update the social media links. There's okay. like a, there's still a Google Plus icon on there, yeah. and that no longer works. But, <laughs> but you have the Facebook uh, link here. You have the Twitter link here. So if you can't remember where did Mike say to go or what what was that link again, just go to doncom.com or .ca, and you have your your social media links right there where you can get them from there. And please be in touch. Email me. Uh, I love chatting about this stuff. If you have an obscure question that you think that I won't bother to take the time to answer, I will jump all over that because that's what I enjoy. If I can sit down and answer, uh, you know, down the rabbit hole emails all day, even if I'm not getting paid for it, I'm still going to be happy at the end of the day. Yeah. So if you need any help with this kind of photography, please just reach out. I'm, I'm more than happy to, uh, to lend my knowledge to you. All right. Well, Don, thank you for coming back on the show. We're going to have to have you back on soon again. Uh, we did have some technical difficulties with uh, YouTube earlier in the show. So if you came in a little late, or you've missed the first part, didn't matter. you didn't come in late. It started late. I have recorded it all for you. So you mm-hmm. can go back and get the first part. And, uh, and get trust me, missed. it's like one of those movies where if you watch the first half again after you've watched the whole thing, it makes a lot more sense. It does. That's what this podcast is. That's what it is. That's what it is. So hang out with us for a few minutes. We're going to head into post-show, but we'll um, see you next show. Till then, keep it raw. Good night, everybody. Good night. All right. Oh, show. So I don't know what happened to YouTube, but all of a sudden, while we were going, I looked up and, hey, we're live. We're we're going. So, uh, Jan. Well, uh, no, no user questions because people probably thought it wasn't happening and then tuned out, right? <laughs> yeah, you, you know, uh, I don't, I don't know. Some, some, no, there was people out there, but nobody said anything except for Jan. So, um, Gary, there's usually people out there who ask questions. So I don't know. If you have questions, we're still sitting hanging out with Don for a few more minutes. If you want to ask a question now, you know, well, they might not realize, realize they were alive, and then by the time they did. Because they probably look around eight o'clock and don't see our show, so they didn't. Uh, and it, and yeah, now. and if it's like eight ten, well, eh, well, they, they they didn't do it, so I'm just yeah. gonna go back to binge watching. I don't gonna, know Netflix or. I'm gonna not pay YouTube anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get get a full refund. Get a full <laughs> refund. Yeah, that's, I mean that's part of the the problem. And YouTube, yeah, look, YouTube does a great job. I, I, I like I was telling you, Don, of all the times we've done this, this is the first time it's. It's not worked. I've had some choppiness before. I've had some other issues, but you know, realizing what they're doing behind the scenes and how much they're working, um, they do a pretty good job. So I don't want to complain about them. It, it's going to happen every now and then. Yeah. Part and of doing. We just have to uh, deal with it because we're not paying a thousand dollars a month for broadcast right. services. It's mm-hmm. all free. <laughs> yeah. And Jan says, "Hope your family's doing well, Don." Uh, and uh, and they are, you know, my daughter is uh, her third birthday is coming up this week, and That's so awesome. uh, it's uh, it's a it's a wonderful time to to be a dad, to having somebody that uh, uh, energetic and inquisitive and curious about the world, um, and uh, it's draining. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, I agree. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I don't think it's going to get much better than that over time. I'm just enjoying it as it comes. Yeah, and mine and on the total opposite side. I last weekend went and looked at apartments with my son, and he put down a deposit on one. He's you know recently graduated from college, got mm-hmm. got his first you know full time job, starting his career, 
and now looking for an apartment. And he, he put down deposit. And tonight he was saying, hey, he sent me the lease information and they want this renter's insurance thing. I said, yeah, welcome to being an adult. You got to get renter's mm-hmm. insurance. <laughs> you got to call. You got to call the insurance company, get renter's insurance. Then you need to call the gas company and the power company and get gas and power. Yep. That's, he goes, what am I going to do that? I don't have time for that. And I said, you want to get yeah, an apartment. And you, you will. Call whatever internet service provider you have. And, yep. um, <laughs> you know, like even for us too, um, the, the, the water is from the city, yeah. but you have to set that up yourself and it's separate. And they, you can't even pay that one. Um, uh, you can't pay it online, but they always send you a letter. Uh, and so it's like, okay, well, you got what? six, seven, eight, nine different bills. If you include the, the home insurance, the car insurance, the insurance for just about everything. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, you know what? Being an adult, being on your own kind of sucks in terms of the amount of money you have to pay other people just in case something bad happens to you. (laughs) That's what, because when he first got his job and got the, you know, the, the offer letter and the amount that was going to be, it's like, oh man, that, to him it's so much money because he's never made any kind of money like that before. And, and then you realize, you know, $5,000 a month just disappears into yeah. well, mortgage at, payments and, and everything else. You look at your your insur- your mortgage, not the mortgage, but in his case, rent and renter's insurance and gas and power. And you mentioned internet. He has not said anything to me about internet. I'm sure when he moves in and he goes and boots up his computer, wait, wait where, where's the internet? How do I... Where, uh, why well, don't I have I, internet? <laughs> well, he might. Uh, l- let's hope that at least initially he has a neighbor nearby with an unprotected Wi-Fi network, and True. he can at least uh, skirt by for a day or two on that before he gets his ducks in a row. But so I went straight from my parents' house to. I didn't go to, off to college where I stayed somewhere. I went from my parents' house to my first, um, uh, you know, apartment when I moved up to Atlanta from from where I was living in Louisiana, and I remember going to take my first shower and realizing. Wait, I don't even have a towel washcloth. <laughs> Wait, there, there, there's no shower curtain here. Who who Dry rents an apartment? With toilet paper and yeah. uh, who and rents an apartment with no list. shower curtain? Well, apparently everybody. And so I had to go to Walmart and buy that stuff. And I come back. I can now have my one towel, one washcloth. I have my shower curtain. I go to put the shower curtain up. Who sells a shower curtain with no rings in it? I can't even put the shower curtain up. Oh yeah, you got to buy the rings separately. <laughs> like, nobody tells me that. I got to go back to Walmart and buy rings now. <laughs> <sighs> so yeah, I mean, we we rented a house, uh, a, a townhouse for about two and a half years, maybe three years, and um, and we we wanted to buy into uh, to something to you know uh, raise a family with. Uh, our our rent uh, for that place was uh, eleven hundred and fifty dollars a month. And uh, and that's Canadian, of course. Yeah. And so there's a bit of a difference. It was a pretty good deal. Um, our our mortgage now on a three bedroom house, finished basement, award winning gardens with century old fruit trees in it, and just our paradise is about $750 every two weeks. So about $1,500 a month. Okay. So for a small increase yeah. um, in, uh, in that uh, of a couple of hundred dollars a month, we're now going to be owning this house. And then, oh, Geez, property tax. Well, crap. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you, um, for it's never ending. It really is. <laughs> his his rent is going to be close to what my mortgage is. Yeah, that's well. And the, the silly thing is, uh, and I know we're uh, still post show recording. Yeah. I don't mind saying how much our mortgage ended up costing us at the time, but it was three hundred and forty seven thousand dollars when we bought this house. Okay. Our neighbor uh, with a fairly similar house is trying to sell it for six fifty now. Nice. And so we've only been here four years, uh, and our house is worth probably at least five fifty, maybe six. Nice. Um, uh, if, if you're looking that's a nice at a appreciation, re- uh, that's, a, that's a very nice appreciation. Except we never want to sell this house. Yeah, we, right. I'll right. die that's in exact, this house. People have said that. So, oh, if you sell your house, you can make this much money. It's like, well, but then I have to move somewhere. Yeah. Exactly. I, and, and here's the problem: I would like my house to be worth one dollar because I would pay property insurance right. on one dollar. Yeah. Uh, I, I or not property insurance. Uh, property uh, tax. Uh, property yeah. tax. Yeah. Because uh, it's based on the value of the homes. So, well, I remember. Uh, you know, I'm wearing my Vancouver shirt, which is on the opposite side out of Canada from you. Uh, but when I was in Vancouver, I remember uh, they were telling us about how the, the real estate market in Vancouver had just exploded and people were buying you know, houses and condos and all this kind of stuff and not even living there. They're just buying it to hold it because oh, yeah. the market was going up so much. Um, you know, the, 
maybe you guys are going through just a real estate boom up there. I don't know. Well, we, we did a few years ago, and it's kind of leveled it out, uh, leveled itself out now. But, um, you know, we're transforming our property into something that I don't think any other people would really want to buy uh, because we're planting tons of uh, manageable, like dwarf style trees that produce fruit. Uh, nice. And very beautiful blossoms, you know, and, and the insects and everything is well, naturalizing it to be perfect for me as a photographer running photographic workshops and everything else. But we're putting trees in the ground that uh, will produce exotic fruits uh, that you can't buy at the grocery store that are completely edible, very delicious, but they're just uncommon. Mm -hmm. um, Mike, have you ever heard of a Shapova? I've not. No. A shapova is a cross between a mountain ash, which is a tree that produces bright orange berries that last through the wintertime. They're largely inedible. Some people claim you can make wine with them, but no. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, a cross between that and a pear tree, which I have no idea how that's possible. But it creates these dainty little tiny pears that have a bit of a unique flavor to them and have no seeds or core inside. You just eat the whole thing. Uh, cool. Just eat it whole. Wouldn't and, that and it, be fun? Yeah, that, and it tastes okay? Uh, from every uh, 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 person that I saw online that has one of these trees, it tastes fine. So I put one in the ground, but it can take up to eight years to bear fruit. So mm. we're only year three right now. <laughs> It'll yeah, be a that's while. That's awesome. When I grew up in South Louisiana, uh, my I had a lot of family in the same little area. And I remember my grandparents had like a Japanese plum tree, which I've never seen that again uh, since we left there, which were just fantastic. Those things were just fantastic. There was a big mulberry tree, which I've never seen again since there. Then we as put a, kid, a white mulberry in the ground this year, and it's going to yeah. be perfect. I would just mm -hmm. go and sit in that tree and eat mulberries until I was sick, literally sick. Those mulberries <laughs> and you'd come home so, and your hands would be stained They would purple. be stained, my <laughs> face would be stained, and I'd be sick. Like, where were you, Mike? I don't know. A mulberry tree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, and other things that we had there. I can't remember. That was so awesome. And it's still, you know, now many, many, many years later, it's still in my head. Uh, for you and your family and your daughter to have, to have those exotic fruits, that is going to be a lifetime of memories and, and a lot of payback. Even something as simple as, as apples, you can get uh, red fleshed apples where yeah. the inside, when you bite into it, instead of it being white, it's red inside. Oh, uh, that's cool. And they're, they're more nutritious because they, they say that the the most nutritious part of the apple is the, the peeling. And if whatever makes that red is actually in the flesh as well, then you've got more nutrients there. But imagine selling that at a supermarket and you just get everybody returning the apples. There's something wrong with this one. Yeah. It's red inside. This one's bad. Yeah. <laughs> that's got a rash. <laughs> Yeah, or uh, a medlar, which I don't mean to uh, opine on fruit too much, but uh, a medlar was the fruit that Romeo and Juliet originally shared uh, in the Shakespeare play, but it's been often rewritten to be an apple or something else. Um, it's a tiny little, uh, it's, I don't know, I mean, smaller than a kiwi kind of fruit okay. size. Um, and it looks incredibly ugly. In fact, the French word for it is uh, col de chien. Uh, which is uh, the dog's behind, to put it politely. <laughs> and it does look like that. Um, yeah. And when the fall comes and the leaves fall off the trees, this fruit is still inedible. Uh, it's so astringent that it's just garbage. You have to wait until that fruit rots. That technical term is bletting. Uh, for it to kind of turn into an applesauce-like texture. And then apparently... It's delicious. Hmm. I have no idea. It's going to produce fruit the first time this year. But my wife, growing up in Bulgaria, in rural Bulgaria, her uh, her grandparents in their village had a medlar tree in their backyard. And every winter, in early winter, this was a delicacy, a little treat. You'd only get it once. You wouldn't get many of them. And it was a, a nice, fond memory. Hmm. So... Why not put that tree in the ground? Yeah. The tree costs, what, 30 bucks? Sure. Uh, it's going to take a couple of years for it to grow from a twig into something useful, but all we got is time, right? Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I can't wait to hear when some of these start bearing fruit, how they work out for you. And I have a, I have a suspicion that medlar flowers will fluoresce like crazy, and I'm going to be able to put that to the test next week. So, Oh, good. So maybe I could make all of these purchases business expenses because, hey, the flowers might glow and I can take pictures. And <laughs> I, and, and, and the fruit and all that you can take pictures of and do workshops on. I don't see any reason why you couldn't. Exactly. Yeah. And the cost is minimal enough. And, and by the way, guys, I have seen a few more uh, contributions to the book come through. I don't know if it's from people that have been listening, uh, but if they are still listening, I say thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. Yep.
Yep, thank you guys. So speaking of that, uh, I've held Don long enough. Um, I generally do this about an hour, so we're about 20 minutes over time. Don, thanks for hanging out with us, and good luck, and I hope that you keep getting more. I, I, yeah, see the yes. number has gone up since we started talking. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's you guys. If you haven't gone out there, I'll put the show notes up, but just go over to doncom.com or .ca, and you'll have the links there, so you can go over and support Don. And get not just support him, but he—he's not just asking for money. He's going to give you something in return. Well, yeah, you're getting a book, yeah. and uh, and and right now, by the way, just if anybody is still listening, the breakdown of the numbers, like we've made over eighty thousand dollars Canadian at this point. It's just remarkable. Um, so Kickstarter gets five percent, and then there's three to five percent that goes to processing fees for credit cards and what mm -hmm. have you. So that's up to ten percent that just gets shaved off the top. About 30% of the total as well, that's logistics. That's me taking your money to ship it to you. So that's money in and money out. I don't actually really get to do anything with that. It's just to get you the book. And the rest of it, 100% of it right now, is going into the printing costs of the book to uh, hopefully print up to 5,000 copies. So uh, it seems like I'm just getting a payday of $80,000. <laughs> I'm yeah. not actually getting a penny of it. Yeah. Um, it doesn't what, work what that I'm, way. Well, what I'm paying myself with is the copies of the book that are left over uh, that I will then be able to sell at a profit. Uh, basically, my break-even point has already arrived by the time the, uh, uh, the, the the books are being sent out to you. And so the rest of it is just gravy for me. Good, and, good. and that's what I'd make my money on. So right now, uh, there is a heck of a lot of work that I need to do between now and then. And, uh, and I appreciate your support. And you'll have a wonderful book at the end of the process. I look forward Looking to receiving it. it, yes. Uh, yeah. All right. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Tim, for coming out. And uh, Jan and anybody else who got to see part of the live show, again, um, <laughs> be looking for the recorded show, which will have the whole thing. But thank you guys for coming. I'm going to stop the stream, and we'll see you next time. All right. All right. Take care.